Uh, uh, it's it's an ironic and great pleasure to welcome Jonathan back from a room that he helped to create as a place for us for many years. And for me, it's a great and sad pleasure. Um, Jonathan's going to speak before. I understand this to be part of the joint project, right? Which Jonathan, okay, Jonathan and Vortex are doing for the Boundary 2 dossier special issue Vortex before. So we have great quality. So, Jonathan. Thank you. Exactly so. And uh, Paul has already preempted minutes of my talk. <laughs> This is it's, the end of the It's really it wonderful to be here with, with you and with my dear friend and editor of 35 years. <laughs> oh. oh, recently I had occasion to think freshly about Lionel Trilling, and that showed up in some of Charles's talk yesterday. And I'm going to start with Trilling getting to Faulkner that way, although that needn't be the way Hortense and I end up doing it. Uh, thinking more about Trilling recently, I read the recently published selection from his correspondence. And that closer look at Trilling's experience in the mid 20th century sharpened my understanding of why it seemed to me right and obvious that literary criticism closely connects to politics, culture mediating between the two. That's Trilling's big picture. I came to think so as a student, I still do. This is a very different account from the, that given by John Gillery in his recent professing criticism. We can talk about that, but that's all I have to say about it now. <laughs> Through this experience, I now understand myself more closely a follower of Trilling than I had previously recognized, but I also feel ever more sharply the innumerable ways I differ from. For today, two moments from those letters mark immense differences. So. Writing in 1955 to his brilliant former BA student, Norman Pedoritz, not yet the reactionary ideologue he became, Frilling reckons, Faulkner will never mean much to me one way or the other, which may be startling since Trilling had actually written back in 1942, a thoughtful and largely favorable review of Go Down Moses. But to, to my reading in this context, Trilling's weak response here in 1955 seems deeply connected to a far more shocking statement a few years later. Writing in 1957 to a young English intellectual, John Wayne, Trilling explains the change the 1950s brought to the concerns that faced leftists slash liberals in the 30s and 40s, quoting Trilling. For example, now, 1957, now that the situation of Geneva has become a matter for government policy, there can be very little intellectual and moral prestige in taking a liberal position on the question. One takes it, of course, but without any sense of doing anything very striking and taking it, there's nothing to do but take it. This seems to me a hair-raising confession of style over substance, posture over politics. Trilling shows no sense whatever, not just in this letter, but through this correspondence, no sense whatever that Brown versus Board of Education 1954 marked a long-prepared, hard-earned beginning to a possible equality that already, as he wrote, had been challenged by the counterforce called massive resistance, which closed rather than integrated schools all over the South. And just a decade later, made George Wallace a terrifying candidate for the presidency. Trilling's letter of 1957 
drove my memory back to a community meeting called by Harvard University in the fall of 1972 to allow the stuffing, Charles, was you there? To allow the stuffing of a new federal mandate called affirmative action. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare as it was, then, was promulgating guidelines for faculty procedures. These guidelines advanced a federal commitment to improve opportunities in higher education for women and people of color. Brilliant's fellow New York intellectual Nathan Glazer had a place on the podium and spoke unforgettable, or at least 50 years later, I still remember it. Glazer asked what it could mean that the federal government chose to treat Harvard as if it were a small Alabama town. <laughs> he didn't cite statistics that would have shown that the level of racial and gender segregation on Harvard's faculty matched that of any Southern town. He simply treated it as absurd that two entities so incommensurable should both be subject to the same laws. <laughs> I've always been immensely grateful for the educational edu opportunities Harvard provided, but I've never loved Harvard. As they once again reminded me last week when they renamed the school from which I hold my PhD in honor of an alumnus who just gave a large gift and as the world's 35th richest person seems likely good for more. I'll spare you the name. Faulkner, it seems, uh, knows better than Harvard that a big fortune suggests some big bad secrets. In the remarks that follow, I try to convey some feel for the literary techniques of Faulkner's work. My subtitle, Faulkner, could be Effects of Style. So literary technique while keeping in view the political, historical, and moral concerns that make the art worth the trouble. And uh, following not only yesterday's paper, but Tony's remarkable uh, talk just now, I will say we're about to enter difficult history. We will not fail to encounter anti-Black racism and the question of history, story, memory, temporality, and timelessness will all be part of, of what we encounter. So Absalom, Absalom, many of you have read it. Some of you will remember the protagonist, Thomas Sutton, instantiates a certain image of settler colonialism and its effects, having uh, built a fortune on a plantation with enslaved labor, worked on land, uh, somehow acquired from the indigenous people who have been on that. Most of the book comes narrated from highly distinctive, highly rhetoricized voices spoken by characters who feel quite a stake in what they're saying. First, Miss Rosa speaking in 1909, whose older sister was married in 1838 to Thomas Sutpen, and after her sister's death, herself was briefly engaged to Sutpen. She speaks with bitter passion of Sutpen as what she calls repeatedly a demon, and her interlocutor, Quentin Thompson who will soon leave Mississippi for Harvard, surmises that she wants him to know the story she's telling so that in the literary career she imagines for him, he can explain to people, and here's Quentin imagining Miss Rose's thoughts, whom she will, people whom she will never see and whose names she will never hear and who have never heard her name or seen her face, he will explain why God let us lose them. Next narrator, Mr. Compson, Quentin's father, who knows some parts of the intervening history directly and who has heard things from his own father, Quentin's grandfather, 
that no one else now knows because old General Thompson, who on the living, was the closest to a friend Sutpen had. Most crucially, Sutpen told him his own account of his early years before, in 1833, he had burst onto the scene of Jefferson, a stranger who by the time of the war became the county's biggest and richest plantation. Quentin himself gains important knowledge firsthand when he goes out the night after his talk with Miss Rosa, and months later, after Quentin learns of Miss Rosa's death, he and his roommate, the Canadian, Shreve McCannon, carry on the narration in a long dormitory gap fenced. Um, part of the placement of Shreve is he is at the utmost northwestern end of the Mississippi Basin. Uh, so the narration is spread among sometimes competing, sometimes collaborating diverse voices. There is no adjudicatory authority to harmonize, reconcile, or verify. And the relationships among the book's times are rarely smooth. In ranging over the century from Sutpen's birth in 1807 to Quentin in 1910, the book's procedure does not put first phase first. Crucial to Faulkner's work is its rooted historicity. Having used that word, I then say we, of course, have just heard very sound reason to wobble on that word, and we'll do so. But still, he is, Faulkner is thoroughly a writer of the South, and the chattel enslavement of African Americans that defined the social and economic system of the antebellum period, and whose consequences are still being worked through in the present of his characters, in the present of his writing, and in the present and presence of our time of reading. All this is part of why, for example, Toni Morrison's beloved could draw on Faulkner for part of the power she brought to that work. <laughs> Yet equally crucial in Faulkner's self-location are other less regional histories. Start with the book's title, absolutely. absolutely. It evokes the cry of David, king of Israel, in the second book of Samuel, when he learns of the death of his rebel son. The Bible story buzzes with the action and themes of Faulkner's work, brother, sister, incest, fratricide, even more fundamental to the novel's construction and composition, I think, are its relations to Greek tragedy signaled by many allusions throughout the work, but most explicitly by the name Sutpen gives to the daughter that comes to him from an enslaved mother, and who is the companion of his white children and the guardian of the house in crucial scenes from the beyond the fall of the plantation from the time of the Civil War to the present of 1909. She is known as Clytie because he named her Clytemnestra, the great queen who killed her husband by the memory. It was remarkable in this literature. Firmly rooted in history, though, the novel is equally set in mythologies. Aristotle's poetics argues that poetry, that is, the making of plots, mythology, is more philosophical than history because poetry can show the course of human action and its relationships of probability and necessity purified of the contingencies that arise in the case of actual history and not muddy the pattern. Certainly shows the essentials and he also slings mud with essentials. Because of the affective logic of thought, which Aristotle says, and there's a lot to it, which achieves its greatest power from terrible things done among those who are dearest to each other. Aristotle observed that tragedians, as he knew, had wisely preferred the stories of a few families, among which those of Agamemnon and Oedipus figure high, 
Those of King David and Thomas Sutcan do pretty well on this scale too. And comparative atrocitology, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez drew on Faulkner to aid, the, sorry, to add the Buendia family to this roster in 100 Years of Solitude, a title itself which really could be exactly a gloss on the world of absolute homicide. The terrible event that generates absolute absolute is simple, to be not so simple. So simply, Sutpen's son and heir, Henry, returns from the Civil War with his closest friend, Charles Vaughn, who is expected to marry his sister, Judith. But just as they reach the house, Henry kills Trace. This much is known from early in the book. And the book's length encompasses an extended retrospective inference. What could have motivated such a deed? One solution after another is tried out. It just doesn't make real sense until a final piece is added that satisfies the inquirer. The answers arise from the destructive irrationality and dehumanizing brutality of the American system of racial hierarchy interlocked with gender civilization. It's said early on, for example, of Sutton, he had come to town to find a wife exactly as he would have gone to the Memphis market to buy livestock or slaves. So the answer to the personal question resonates with the fate of a whole culture and nation and mode of organizing labor to produce mansions built on what the book calls a black foundation. The first answer proposed by Mr. Clement Compson reaches out from backwoods Mississippi to the cosmopolitan metropolis in New Orleans, 600 miles away where cotton was shipped to the world and where Charles Bond came from, world of Catholic religion and French language. When Henry visited Bond, he learned of beautiful women classified as black, but visually indistinguishable from white, who were raised to be the treasured sexual companions of the city's elite. Charles had gone through a ceremony of marriage with his lover, and even though marriage to a Negro had no legal standing, Henry could not accept that this did not make Charles's intended marriage to Judith bigger. That's Mr. Compson's version. The final answer goes a long way beyond that. Sutton had made his first fortune in the West Indies as the overseer of a sugar plantation. There's a very well-known and imperfectly resolved uh, historical question about the historical issue of the narrative of Absalom Absalom, the West Indies. Haiti is specifically named at several points, and yet in the chronology of the book, it would not have fitted the structure of slavery that is uh, essential to the narrative. So there's there's probably a conflation of actually existing sugar plantations that remained after Haiti's revolutionary independence, and at the same time, the conjuring power of a particular event in history that resonated across the United States and its implications. So, uh, Sutpen goes through the West Indies as the overseer of a sugar plantation. He married there, but he then discovered that his wife was not part Spanish, as he had been told, but I quote, part Negro. He ended the marriage and, in his words, provided for her and put her aside. Well, this is an earlier generative total event. So Charles Baum is not visually, but by social understanding, to his father, at least, black half-brother to Henry and Judith, just as flighty as their half-sister. The book offers an amazing page and a half-long sentence from which I can only excerpt 
that triangulates the Caribbean with Africa and North America in an Atlantic historical knotting that is now actively explored in scholarship and literature alike, and which Hortense was one of the first to highlight. I just put the needle down on the record a little bit. Where high mortality was concomitant with the money and the sheen on the dollars was not from gold, but from blood, a little island set in a smiling and fury lurked and incredible indigo sea, which was the halfway point between what we call the jungle and what we call civilization. Overall, as I have suggested, the relation of the book to the events of 1865, the end of the Civil War, the horror of the Sutton family, is a relation of after, and I quote from the book. There is no all, no finish, it not the blow we suffer from, but the tedious repercussive anticlimax of the Matashi aftermath. Out of that anticlimax, Faulkner builds the rich language of meditation, lament, regret, and speculation that makes up much of the book. Through the relationship between that aftermath and its originating moments in the past, which the book can return to in ways that people can't actually in their lives, Faulkner composes a ribbon for his book that to my reading develops a potential within Greek tragedy that becomes more pronounced in the realm of his narrative than it readily can even within the genre of drama, from which I think it's drawn. In the composition of Greek tragedy, and I doubt that I can be corrected for the better, but in the composition of Greek tragedy, the stylistic extremes are at one end the choral odes, poems sung and danced, which move off from the immediate action at hand and open, open wider reflections on the relationships of humanity to the ordering principles of the universe in elaborate and complex strophic patterns. At the opposite extreme from the odes comes the exchange of single lines back and forth between characters an extreme of eloquence against an extreme of terseness. Some of you may recall that I discuss a, the use of a similar technique in Beloved in the essay I wrote for the symposium on that. Faulkner's stylistic norm across his major narrating voices stands at the eloquent, elevated, complicated, the language of, of accurate. In contrast, the novel repeated, though at long intervals, spotlights brief moments of verbal intensity between its major characters. Insofar as we already from the beginning know the key events, it's hard to say that the technique is suspense, but as a constructive principle, it may readily be called suspension. We are strung along awaiting the bare words or the bare facts that have generated so much misery. Against the endless aftermath, Faulkner counterbuilds his world with a violent condensation of time. Quentin thinks of the moment when Henry Sutpen comes home to tell his sister that he has just killed Charles Bond, her fiance whose return she's been anticipating. So, in what I'm about to read, you'll hear a long sentence followed by a quick sequence of short ones. Quentin was not listening because there was also something which he too could not pass. That door, the running feet on the stairs beyond it, almost a continuation of the faint shot, the two women, the negress and the white girl in her underthings, made of flower sacking when there had been flour, window curtains when not, pausing, looking at the door, the, the yellowed creamy mass of old intricate satin and lace spread carefully on the bed and then caught swiftly up by the white girl and held before her as the door 
crashed in and the brother stood there, hatless with his shaggy bayonet trimmed hair, his gaunt, worn, unshaven face, his patched and faded gray tunic, the pistol still hanging against his flank. The two of them, brother and sister, curiously alike, as if the difference in sex merely sharpened the common blood to a terrific, almost unbearable similarity speaking to one another in short, brief, staccato sentences like slaps as if they stood breast to breast, striking one another in turn, neither making any attempt to guard against the blows. Now you can't marry. Why can't I marry? Because he's dead. Dead? Yes, he killed him. Quentin was still thinking about this moment months later in Cambridge. The two of them slashing at one another with 12 or 14 words. Most of these the same words repeated two or three times. So when you think about it, they did it later 10. Literary audience thinking. The very last sequence of the book involves Quentin in Cambridge in bed. Thinking about that night in September in Mississippi six months ago when he'd gone with Miss Rosa out to the room at Sutpen's and discovered there Henry Sutpen, whose whereabouts had been unknown to Jefferson since the day he shot Tron 44 years early. The initial narration skips over what Quentin found in a cut that we may well consider filmic. He was already by this time experienced as a Hollywood screenwriter, indeed, did some of the last writing on Absalom in Hollywood. So, quoting now in Quentin's mind, I must see two now. I will have to. Maybe I shall be sorry tomorrow, but I must see. So when he came back down the stairs, the queen I must see, and so he came back down the stairs, there was only Clyde sitting in the room. The blank between the two sentences is only filled in after Clinton's returned home and begins to go to bed. Note again, a long single sentence of interior reflection building up to the staccato repetitive exchange. I want to bathe, he thought. Then he was lying on the bed, naked, swabbing his body steadily with the discarded shirt, sweating still, panting, so that when his eye muscles aching and straining into the darkness and the almost dried shirt still clutched in his hand, he said, I have been asleep. It's all the same. There was no difference. Waking or sleeping. He walked down that upper hall between the scaling walls and beneath the cracked ceiling toward the faint light which fell outward from the last door and paused there, saying, no, no, and then I must, I have to, and went in, entered the bare, stale room whose shutters were closed to where a second lamp burned dimly on a crude table. Waking or sleeping, it was the same. The bed, the yellow sheets and pillow, the wasted yellow face with closed, almost transparent eyelids on the pillow. The wasted hands crossed on the breast as if you were already a corpse. Waking or sleeping, it was the same. You would be the same forever as long as you lived. And you are, and we sucked up. And you have been here four years, and you came home to die, yes. To die? Yes, to die. You've been here four years, and you are memory sought now. Few repetitive words. And Quentin in bed in Cambridge repeats Quentin in bed at home, repeats Henry in bed at his home, while the sequence of Quentin coming up the stairs guarded by Clyde repeats the attempt by Miss Rosa to come up those stairs to that room after Henry had shot on 44 years earlier. We may recall the novel that Faulkner learned a lot from, Joyce's Ulysses, when Stephen Douglas says history is a nightmare from which I'm trying to awake. On the one hand, and on the other hand, that 
sequence of quantum momentum. I mean, if, if that isn't the transumption of Poe, I don't know what. Charles Bond's appearance at the House of Sutpen itself repeats crucial elements in the childhood experience of Sutpen that, as he recounts to Grandfather Compson, formed the basis for his subsequent life course. That's yet an earlier generative event. Sutpen was the child of poor Western Virginia mountain folk who had come down to the Tidewater plantation country. With the democratic ethos of poor people who've never known the existence of wealth, Sutpen came to the door of a great house to deliver a message and was turned away by the enslaved Black woman. The world shattering power of his social disrespect, what in another context William Spenos wrote up as the neighborhood of zero determined Sutpen to make himself invulnerable any such things ever happening again. Like Ahab's, I will dismember my dismemberer. This intended reverse reaction only leads to more of the same, but worse. For Blom comes to Sutpen's door, hoping in some way to be acknowledged, and Sutpen gives no sign. Bond's increasingly desperate need to evoke some response from Sutpen motivates his suicidal courtship. Adamant to the end, Sutpen does not speak with Bond, but tells Henry that Bond's mother had, in his terms, Negro blood. When Henry and Bond confront each other after this, each loving the other, each torn by the impossibility of the situation, it finally comes to a head in the climactic terse exchange, which again is part of the, the, the terse back and forth that I've spoken of as one of the stylistic extremes. Because I'm speaking to the world uh, virtually, uh, I'm going to change Faulkner's text a little bit because he uses here a word that we now aren't going to use in public company. And in doing so, he registers here as he does elsewhere, something of the function of anti-Black racism that is, as Tony says, a necessary component of understanding what's not only a set of economic transactions. Henry says, you are my brother. And Bond replies, no, I'm not. I'm the word not to be spoken. It's going to sleep with your sister. The human intimacy of brotherhood, the social ideal of fraternity, Bond who has lived as a commanding figure in New Orleans society, all evaporate into a vicious stereotype. Faulkner knows better. His characters do also, but they cannot bring their lives into accord with their better knowledge. Faulkner in this novel shows that the N word that we now won't say functions to disrupt human humane relationships, which of course are already disrupted by the whole social system that uh, has produced this word and its meanings. The terrible absurdity in this exchange between Henry and Bond is prefigured in Miss Rose's report of her rushing to the Sutpen house when she has learned that Henry shot Bond. She wants to go upstairs to Judith, but Clyde stands in her way. Rosa is shocked that Clyde addresses her by her first name with no title of respect, and then Rosa is further shocked when she touched me. My, this is now Rosa. Uh, my entire being seemed to run at full blind tilt into something monstrous and immobile with a shocking impact too soon and too quick to be mere amazement at that black arresting and untimorous hand on my white woman's flesh because there is something in the touch of flesh with flesh which abrogates 
cuts sharp and straight against the devious, intricate channels of decorous ordering which enemies as well as lovers know because it makes them both touch and touch of that which is the citadel of the central I am's private own, not spirit, soul. The licorice and the money girdled mind is anyone's to take in any darkened hallway of this earthly tenement. But let flesh touch with flesh and watch the fall of all the eggshell shivers of caste and color, too. Yes, I stopped dead. No woman's hand, no Negro's hand, but bitted bridal curb to check and guide the furious and unbending will. I try not to her, to it, speaking to it through the Negro. The woman, only because of the shock, which was not yet outrage, because it would be terror soon, expecting no answer, because we both knew it was not to her I spoke. Take your hand off me, then the word of racial abuse. Shocked as Rosa is, the reader can only be more shocked by the disproportion the incommensurability between her touching, exploratory self-explanation and her actual spoken command. Nor is it easy to accept her claim that we both knew it was not to her that I spoke. It's somewhat like Ahab's attempt to explain that in hunting the whale, he is seeking to strike through the mask and reach a reality walled in behind that white appearance. In an email exchange with Hortense some time ago, this passage seemed to strike sparks for both of us. And that's where the idea for this collaboration came from. That's what I leave you for now. We have a few minutes left for questions. Certainly, it is a kind of history. That is to say, it's not just Miss Rosa's damn foolishness that uh, allows the idea to be put into play in the book, that if you follow out the story, you'll have some idea about why there was a war and why it turned out the way it did. The means of doing it certainly can be called um, liminal in all sorts of ways. I mean, first of all, of course, um, we have those literal threshold moments that are so important in the now narrative, and several of which I've I've touched on. Um, so, uh, so, so Penn not being able to cross over uh, Charles Bond admitted and yet closed out. Um, but also, of course, liminal in the sense that uh, these, these are not authorities speaking, but only the people who happened to be there and to know something of, of what happened. So I'm certainly comfortable with both dimensions uh, of that phrase, liminal history. Uh, it's certainly true, in my experience, 
that in order to register as strongly as possible or as fully as possible, the ways in which this is condensed essential history as well as a brilliant work of uh, fiction in order to feel that conviction, it helps to know what, what historians in their various guises have had to say about the subject. That is, I think that Faulkner can, can give you a sense of history, a feel of history, but you see more and more what good history it is, the more you know about what the historians have said. That but not, not only that they confirm in various ways, Faulkner, but also he adds dimensions to the experience that is hard to find among the historians. In, I'll stop there because there may be other people and uh, you may want to pick up and further push me uh, on yourself or they may have a word to say too. Anyway. Would you say more about two stylistic extremes which you dramatized so very, very strongly? I mean, the sort of uh, oral, strophic mood and uh, very quick back and forth dialogue. I think it's because it felt like there was a maybe I'm making this up. Uh, there were the human possibilities of expression that were part of the oral, strophic stuff. Long sentences, which were kind of denied, you know, couldn't make it into what people actually said to each other. And then you were really trying to, you, you yourself had some kind of investment in that other mode, which, is, which, is, which transcends, if you want, the banality or the ugliness of what people say to each other. Yeah. Um... Well, it's it's certainly true that you you could say that to think imaginatively about life requires going beyond the moment of its happening. Uh, it, it, I will say, I don't know if you have this in mind, Bruce, but this this is uh, this is eerie to me. Um, my rather unsuccessful senior thesis was written on William Wordsworth's early play, written, written the, the year before he had Coleridge come to work on lyrical ballads, Wordsworth's play called The Borderers, which you can have Faulkner because it takes place on the Northern English Scottish border area, which is where some of Faulkner's people came from. That's a whole other story. Anyway, in The Borderers, there's a, uh, a, a villainous charismatic figure named structurally the Iago of the, of the plot, who tempts the hero by into, into a, a deed that he then regrets, explaining uh, action is transitory. The motion of a muscle this way or that is done and in the after vacancy, we wonder at ourselves like men betrayed. Suffering is permanent, obscure, and dark, and has the nature of infinity. And, oh, fuck me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> excuse me? This is the ammunition series. I quoted various places. It's not quite my King Charles's head, but uh, I believe this is the first time I've ever publicly acknowledged its place in my unsuccessful early efforts. <laughs> Sharing with words of unsuccessful early effort. Yes, Don. I thought this was a brilliant performance in every sense that drew out of you what I consider one of your biggest gifts, uh, an answerable style. Uh, and you put yourself in a position in which you had to answer a pro style uh, that puts everyone in an extreme position which one is 
and a limit to finding the words that might possibly begin uh, to do interpretive justice to what's getting expressed in a text. And, and you did it so brilliantly. I'm wondering about the one moment uh, in which the, uh, the word that should not be spoken, the unspeakable, uh, and um, when the unspeakable, uh, which is itself language at a kind of uh, limit site, becomes the only word that can be spoken at that site. Is it a matter of um, stereotype uh, taking over, or has something else speaking the unspoke, unspeakable? Um, if, if that which is unspeakable um, remains unspoken, then um, something that's at stake in that scene um, might not uh, become sentient. Yeah, um, well, there's, there's everything in the world to say about that. Uh, In my book on Jerry Finn, talk about the problem of, of this word and my my distress at the idea that one of the ways in which the canonization of Huckleberry Finn seemed to function was to allow polite, proper white people to use this word uh, in, and feel that they were being good people by doing it. As against that, I was willing in my introduction to, or I guess it's an afterward, to the Sigmund edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin to say, in contrast to Huckleberry Finn, Harriet Beecher Stowe was willing to show at the end of her book that one white person is using this word to another white person about a third person of color was grounds for the addressee to punch out the person who had used them. That is to say, it's a fighting term. Uh, and you'd never know that from reading Mark Twain. And that may be true to a certain social fact of the world he was representing or the world he was writing in, but he successfully masked it from his readers a hundred years later in a way that Stowe didn't. The people at Penguin told me I couldn't use that. It was extraneous to add the comparison to Huckleberry Finn. Uh, so, uh, so the idea that uh, that in a, in another piece of following the Huckleberry Finn book, in which I asked. Why does no one care about the aesthetic value of Huckleberry Finn? The answer being because people want the book to do too much and mean too much. The idea being that aesthetics is not about either doing or meaning, but just being. And in that context, I evoked what Shelley, as a committed atheist, had to say about Christian theology in relation to poetry. Shelley looked forward to a day when the only reason anyone would know anything about Christian theology was to write footnotes to Dante and Milton. And I, I said, when that is true of that word, that it exists only as something that needs a footnote to explain it, then we can treat it very thin, purely aesthetically. Just they struck. So, I, I, there's more, but time has told. Here, here, this is more.
Ale stratić? Anyway, we're, we're going to have Don lead us to final conversation. Now, thank you very much for this opportunity. I want to begin by expressing, as did Tony, my deep gratitude, um, Boundary 2 Collective. I uh, first encountered uh, Boundary 2 when Jonathan Arak, uh, after we had shared a couple of in English institutes and a University of Chicago symposium with uh, Derrida, said, I think you might be interested in meeting some of my colleagues, Boundary 2. Uh, there are, I think it was uh, the originals, there are three of us now, Jonathan, Paul, and myself. It was back in 1979, we had a meeting at the Theological Institute at Cornell West attended, Dos Banos. You gave a talk on, uh, on Kierkegaard, and so did uh, Cornell West. There was a wonderful set of uh, agreements and disagreements. And then I met the Boundary 2 Collective. And when life in the academy, when in university, uh, felt as if it wasn't what I imagined life in an English department uh, in a university would be, Boundary 2, for me, became the site in which all of my aspirations for what uh, teaching in a university, literature, might entail. Better because these were scholars who took everything we think about and do in a classroom quite seriously, seriously enough to uh, put in an argument everything at stake. And um, we had intense conversation. And at a time of transition in which uh, uh, Bill Spanos passed on boundary two and the responsibility for it. Uh, to uh, Paul Bove, not only his, his best student, but also uh, the person who had the ethos uh, and the mythos, <laughs> well, the pathos, and the great aspiration of Boundary Two in his heart uh, and in his uh, considerable understanding of what had it to, had to be added in order for Boundary 2 to survive and thrive in a world in which uh, the great competition amongst journals, something that made survival necessary, all took the steps needed to make that transition. And he not only took the steps needed to make that transition, he knew who had to be added to Boundary 2 uh, in order to continue the vitalization of not only the journal, but the sense of intense collegiality that makes a collective, not just a rhetorical trope, but a reality. So at this moment of transition, very important, which Paul is passing on the responsibility, member of uh, Boundary 2, members, six members of Boundary 2, who will carry uh, everything that Paul has at heart to the next stage of the journal. This moment of transition is one in which I think we all have to acknowledge the, the great, great responsibility Paul Bouvet has not only assumed, but for the sake, not only the journal, but for the collective actualized in a way only he could and can and does. Please join me in thanking Paul. Paul has also given me the impossible task of uh, responding to what I consider the two days of Terrific. I'm going to hesitate to use the word great. Reasons that uh, Bruce has presently 
inhibited. But uh, nevertheless, uh, I, uh, I consider these presentations um, quite remarkable and deserving of uh, a collective response. So I'm going to try to uh, take a term that appeared in one of the talks that I think um, has resonance throughout all of them. It's a term of, of art that uh, Nergis introduced uh, in order to turn a corner, to use one of Bruce's tropes, in her argument. And it was stated this way, uh, that she was interested in engaging a foreclosed future in the past, a foreclosed future in the past. That term resonated for me uh, and has um, uptake for me in my ears for all of the talks uh, that we've heard, because we began with a, uh, with a talk in which the understanding of greatness introduced a temporal, uh, an aesthetic, as well as a political uh, set of resonances. And uh, Bruce had, in his remarkable introductory talk, has this sense, an important sense, of a progressive understanding of history that's linked simultaneously to an understanding that greatness can only be acknowledged when it is not attributed to a single individual, but to, uh, to use Benjamin's, the anonymous toil of an assemblage. And um, a foreclosed future suddenly also became quite animate and almost um, precariously imagined when both uh, Casey and Christian took up the question of the Anthropocene, the climate change, uh, as what in foreclosing human history also inhibited prohibited, perhaps, certain understandings of uh, the political because of its overriding monopoly over uh, what might be called uh, eventuation. This led me to wonder, precisely because Christian had, had and, and with his, his great sense of irony, uh, brought in the paradox of uh, narrativizing climate change, where crisis would always already, according to the concept of narratology that he invoked through Jeanette and Todorov, in which um, crisis, even when it's a crisis that is utterly catastrophic, um, can be negotiated narratologically into, if not quite an equilibrium, a metastasis equilibrium. That particular uh, paradox uh, awakened uh, for uh, Casey and said he wanted to retrieve the kind of, uh, that for him was the foreclosed future for forms of revolutionary history, politics. But what's left out of the image of the Anthropocene, the sense that uh, certain persons in the process of becoming human, in quotes, had already experienced the Anthropocene. Catastrophe in Tony's uh, wonderful explanation of um, what, is, what it is that gives access uh, to the liminal, to the memory without a foundational history. Um, it's um, the sense of catastrophe, that in having been 
lived by uh, persons uh, in colonial period associated with genocide and slavery, but also, and this is where it became lively for me, not only because Bruce is including this in his study of atrocity, but also when, uh, when Charles talked about the, uh, the ways in which, um, when he was emerging as a poet in an academy that had already presupposed a canon that only white Anglo-Saxon Protestants could possibly either represent or continue this was also a, uh, an aspect of the ambivalent relationship between assimilating in the, the aesthetic normative terms of that canon and remaining in an ambivalent, agreeing to be interpolated by it, but not assimilated, but remaining in an ambivalent relationship to it. That, that to me, also resonated powerfully uh, with what um, I think is a keynote. When um, David this morning talked about the ways in which when he teaches class, his students, when they take up theory, want to move so quickly to the activist relation to the theory that they arrive at Manichaean, polarized and polarizing positions, perhaps because this generation feels more than any other generation, the absence of a future, a foreclosed future, a foreclosed future, not only because of the generalized overriding image of the Anthropocene, but a foreclosed future that suddenly became even perhaps uh, this generation is the post 9-11 generation of what was never supposed to happen in the United States. Uh, the, the catastrophe that was never supposed to happen had happened. I think the, the excess demand on a political position that can feel righteous and right without the ambivalences, without um, the complications, might be what um, generates uh, this, this sense. And, and here I'm taking a risk in making this statement. I don't mean it to be a generalization. I don't even know whether it's a truism. I don't even know whether it's true. It's, it's a thought that's been evoked by this conversation. What I so deeply admired about uh, both Tony's talk and Jonathan's that followed is um, the demand both made on themselves and their prior thinking about history and uh, also on listeners who had known their prior positions in history. When Tony introduced the notion of the liminal of liminal history, and it gave this sense that artists are the figures who theorize it perhaps more profoundly than can analytic thinkers, and demonstrated how in that last um, mural, I would call it, which is he was just titled memory without history, the demand constantly to reconfigure because every moment can be a moment in which you feel the catastrophe, in which there's utterly no stability whatsoever. Every moment of stepping perhaps into an abyss uh, requires that human beings, this is where the singular universal for me became once again animate. Uh, the singular universal is, the, is what arises when human beings has the sense that each human being, each particular uh, experiences the universal 
according to the singular position of the particular. And uh, that then becomes possibly a collective experience when that singular universal awakens uh, what might be called the universality of singularities in a constant reimagining. When, when Jonathan, in a wonderful moment of his elegant, eloquent presentation about the way in which suspense at a certain moment of reading Faulkner uh, led him to, into a condition of suspension, which he wonderfully associated with putting a new bead on a string a new, new response to a new demand. It's the excess of demand that Faulkner's probes. How do you respond to Faulkner's probes without feeling as if every response is too scarce, is impoverished? Jonathan made throughout that wonderful presentation, um, the sense of the stakes of that, so powerful for his identity as a literary scholar, going back to his beginnings. For me, that was the moment in which also I felt he was doing what exactly what Tony was describing, stepping into what now felt, in retrospect, foundationless. Training. So to take that series of uh, yes. perhaps ad hoc remarks and uh, reconvoke them as a uh, as a kind of a collective question, I'd, I'd like to wonder with you whether or what you would do to the claim or with the claim that this is a moment in literary history, in the history of teaching literature and thinking about literature. The talk I was going to give was on John Guillory, who I described as the organic intellectual of the uh, <laughs> transnational managerial class, uh, which is really what he was. If, if he's thinking about the identity he assumed when he taught literature, it wasn't as a literary professor that he described himself as being, who simply did commentary. He didn't just do commentary. Uh, he did. He was functioning as a managerial a class member. He was telling everybody how to manage uh, the, what had happened to the deficiency of funding in literature departments uh, by by going to a theory of uh, literary capital that he was capitalizing uh, throughout his, his career. And uh, then he's saying it's all dead because he's going. It's not dead. It's, it, it means because he's going. And uh, what Stuckey's calls a left governmentality, an understanding of what we do in literature classes uh, can have political stakes that R.A. Judy describes as generative of poetic socialities, spontaneously generative of poetic socialities, mm -hmm. so that once again, beings can have a sense that the world in which we exist, we simultaneously create and are fleshly created by. We create, we, we live in that middle voice. We create the world, and the world we create creates us. And with the, with the codicil, with the proviso, we can remake that world. So I, I'm wondering uh, if what you do with the claim, that we're presently living in a moment in which the foreclosure of the future in the present makes the present feel 
as if it's a condensation of all of the disasters from the past that demand the kind of either or um, that many, um, many perhaps um, in the name of what I consider generally progressive activism, generally. It's it's a provocative question, and I don't mean it to be too provocative. I would I would love any of the nuance and complication you'd like to introduce. The response I wanted. <laughs> Yes, please, Bruce. Um, I have been tempted on occasion by the thought that we're at something like the moment of the end of the Roman Empire. And don't, don't press that too far, but let's say the barbarians that they see the barbarian, or, you know, the tribe and whatever. Um, and it's the moment to kind of retreat into the monasteries and, you know, Take uh, the high civilization that we you know, feel ourselves to be in the public, or whatever, and think that for a long time it's going to be really shit outside. But we're going to keep it um, And when I, when I think it's like, you think that boundary two in some way has been tempted by this and has somehow found a way of refusing it. That is, and, and as getting that last note that you, that you get, or Tony's note, you know, that basically this is about making a change in common sense. So I don't know, it's just a, a feeling I have about the history of the journal during the years that I've been associated with. Monasteries alternative has been somehow, you know, in the back of people's minds, maybe not as such, but something like it. Um, and yet we have sort of collectively managed not to go that way. It's a thought. Wonderful thought. Status. Yeah. To... See, that's the beginning that they come out in, in, in the space that I'm in. Uh, I don't know how I'm in space that I'm in. But what if I'm barbarian? So, uh, <laughs> this arose in time, but I was already thinking, uh, uh, uh that, um, you know, one of the things to do is to choose not to see the future as for a club, um, a or which is another way of saying the same thing, more into our good thing. How can we proceed in the way that you're challenging us to proceed without falling into catastrophology? Which is very important to me. Uh, <laughs> because, you know, catastrophic thinking is, uh, you know, a kind of a solution. It's, it's, it's what enables, you know, a certain... The status quo continue to exist all the way to the end. And the past is really, I mean, whether it's politically outright or really as teacher of literature in the classroom, is, is how to uh, prevent <laughs> the catastrophe yes. from happening, even, you know, on the very edge as we're falling. You know, that, that kind of crazy utopian, you know, old, old side of utopian thing. So that to me is something that I can't let go of, you know, in that accepting this, this, this challenge. So there, there are two options. Maybe the barbarians will not come up. <laughs> <laughs> or we are to try to make sure they don't. You know? <laughs> I think that's a, also a wonderful addition. And it, it gives me an occasion to mention a nuance in, in uh, the uh, apprehension of Paul's book, which, well, although uh, it does, um, as you as you wonderfully point out, David, resist the temptation to melancholia, um, the the reason I think Paul 
uh, is refusing um, the usual understanding of hope, which would be associated with futurity, would be that um, the, the hope is not uh, really uh, in, in Paul's, uh, I think, very, very uh, nuanced and acute analysis of theories of hope. It's, it's usually a, a refunctioning of um, an already allegorized future. Uh, allegorized um, by uh, either political thinkers or 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 literary thinkers. So um, there is in Paul's argument, I believe, a um, a meta melancholia, <laughs> uh, if I might say, if I might say so. Um, Paul is. Um, uh, knows the anatomy of melancholy in the way that uh, Ahab and Melville uh, do. And he knows uh, also um, the sequence of that, which allowed him to read Dante's um, Paradiso more brilliantly than anyone I've ever encountered. Uh, so I, I, I think there is, um, uh, in the messianic relation, the quasi-messianic relation, the catastrophe. And Paul's uh, uh, amor fati relation to catastrophe. As if, it, it, there's the, 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 the unstated in Paul is that it, it's, it's a love of the fate we've created. It's a love of the fate we've created that um, bottoms out melancholy. Which is essentially right. <laughs> yes, exactly. I use the word both, but I, I, I actually... No, I know you don't, but you use radical utopia, yes, which masquerades as hope. You don't know what you're calling it. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. right. Yes. But I... I, I uh, for anyone who hasn't read uh, Stata's trilogy on um, Western humanism, it is one of the most uh, uh, brilliant journeys <laughs> I've encountered in um, the literary world in a long time. And I recommend it to everyone. The third book in the trilogy is about to appear, and uh, I recommend it to everyone. Mm -hmm. But that's just my blab. And all right. Yeah, I I see the I find it interesting the way you can actively supply subscribers about the ways you set of practices, ways of conversation, engage that open I want to play that to your engagement with the problem. To suggest. Regards to students that what we're seeing is that a foundation turned on a very specific conceit of mythology in which there is a particular self that could be the agent. Of appropriation, destruction, and management, and never at all be the object of explicit. Ah. And what's occurred is that you see it's dissipated. I, I, I'm just remembering, and it was the only moment on, on BBC4 in 2002, where we made a new 
in which Edward makes the statement to use the term that supposedly you can't say publicly. But I say, this is a historical residence, that in the wake of that event, my mother, we've all become neighbors. Cornell had a particular situation. So in the scenes right now, what's occurred is, is that 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 implacement no longer is there. Exactly. Okay. And that's the sense of despair. But what Tony was telling us and we're calling these practices is there are people who already work constantly without the possibility of implacement. And in that constitution, engaging practices that were not that strong. Yes. Yeah. That were not stepped And indeed, we have a certain pedagogical position for us now. What's the difference? I don't think it's going to be But there are poetic practices that have been going on for quite a time. And so, you know, the, the fear of all <laughs> that we have is it's being groundless, right? And in fact, it does what precisely says. The same as the threat of the catastrophic. If it becomes a messianic, and it's an effort to try and get back to that self, it simply is no story. This is one of my problems with our body. Uh -huh. Disagreeing with our body in Switzerland, previous, what I characterize as the last man standing in space, which is why I don't have either as an example of Boethius or Castellotis of, of, of preservation and conservation. Because that precisely, there's the foreclosure on, on infinite possibilities that are practiced already among diverse populations. Already, we're caught up in what is, as in my arm calls it, the fundamental tendency of capitalist community with the fact. Wonderfully so, articulated. I want to say, Tony, it's fun to see what we talk about. The capacity, it's, it's when we do that that we can. Back yeah, what, what you just said, it brings to mind two um, moments. Um, Tony's reminding us that instead of um, listening simply to uh, what's being uh, said within the academy uh, and amongst um, theorists in the academy, begin to put a listening ear to what Tony calls the people. Uh, and this is where what Tony means by common sense is, is, is really um, that which is emerging as a way of continuing the process of becoming human in a world in which the notion of humanity has been overridden and monopolized by conceptualization of the human um, that is unlivable. It, 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 what for me was the, the antiphonic moment, I read you and Tony in some ways in conversation with each other. You have this in, remarkable moment that sticks out in my head. But you said, it's possible for people to have a spontaneous critique uh, that generates an alternative sociality, an alternative voices, um, which is lived in the flesh. And um, that, for me, became one of the ways to hear your um, response to Tony's account of what was happening in liminal history. There are a whole series of um, uh, emergent um, modes of thinking about this moment that various members of the collective are involved in, um, in thinking. Kara hasn't spoken at this session except with her wonderful uh, questions, but Kara's been thinking of, about the problematics, the limitations of uh, what is usually understood as representation in a way that uh, I think would we, we, we would all benefit 
uh, from your elaboration of that, none of our conversations would, I think, at least in the United States, uh, for Americans be possible, without Hortense Spiller's work, not just in the iconic essay, but those of you who have um, not yet read Black and White and then Color, which I have now read, um, paged from cover to cover several times. Um, she, she's prescient and has imagined multiple futures that I'm still trying to figure out. And will be, and will be while I'm still on this side of the grass. <laughs> so, but Kara, would it be too much to ask if you, I know in the, in the exchange, the wonderful exchange you had earlier, with Christian, and uh, it was it brought out that allowed Christian to give an elaboration of what he meant, but also you you left kind of uh, abbreviated what um, you were saying about the importance of uh, rethinking um, the monopoly of uh, that representation continues to enjoy, and in processes of engagement with questions such as. Um, political revolution and climate change. Is it too much? There? I don't mean to put you on the spot, Kara. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I can say anything before that. Um, here, but I will say, you know, unlike I think many of you, I don't teach literature much. Um, although having been here, I think maybe put a novel in one of my classes. <laughs> Yeah, so I think you know most of most of my thinking has been from film and art, the movie image, um, time-based media, uh, digital media, and so in that context, I think I've been thinking more recently in terms of picking up things that I think were already in my first two books around um, these questions of representation, in particular the first book, which, which was my dissertation, which started. Here. <laughs> um, so in, in that book, which is why I was, I was really interested in thinking about sort of the um, the investment in representation as a kind of way of um, securing certain kinds of political positions and the way that representation folds into sort of a uh, uh, call for recognition and folds therefore also into a sort of state appeal uh, to state. And so more recently, I've been trying to push that a little bit further, but also in aesthetic. So I guess I would say that um, for me, in terms of my own thinking right now, one of the things that I'm interested in is thinking about aesthetic forms that don't easily fall into what we recognize as representation and therefore identity identification and all of the things that follow. Um, uh, but also sort of representation more broadly. So I don't know if this is really- It does, it really helps immensely. And, and thank you for sharing that. Let's thank Kara for sharing that right on the spot. And it, 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 it's also connected to, and, and I want to ask Charles, because I know this is really also Charles's turn. Uh, there's something about the cunning of liberal misrecognition uh, that uh, is also at the heart of the liberal imagination that Jonathan uh, so wonderfully um, simultaneously described and crit criticized. Uh, Elizabeth Pavanelli, um, talks about this, and, and I know you quote her several times, uh, uh, in, in which, um, oh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the liberal uh, state already has a set of pre-existing representations uh, that it projects in the name of the liberal imagination onto um, persons. <laughs> who do not cohere with those pre-existing representations, which because they're understood to be liberal cannot be construed as stereotypical. 
and cannot be construed as, um, uh, as intolerant. What I found moving about uh, Charles' presentation was I, I thought he inhabited the, what I would call the, uh, uh, the ego ideal of uh, the liberal imagination, uh, which is at the point at which the liberal imagination says, we tolerate everything except what we claim to be intolerant. And uh, it's at that site I heard uh, Charles uh, animate uh, the distinctions between identifying with those pre-existing identity formation and in the name of representing the Americanist poetic canon. And it has an aesthetic to it. Uh, at the same time as he was engendering an ambivalence, what I would call uh, a um, critical ambivalence, uh, that was always also at the very moment of um, taking up the position, was also poetically refusing and generating a whole set of audible um, and wonderfully inflected um, dialect turns on the representations uh, that uh, makes your poetry <laughs> so distinctive and wonderful, Charles. Tony, please. Look. Yeah, I could I try, um, go back to the question you read, but I just want to, to say the scroll. Uh, the essay, the essay one, two, that I've said to the students, my commandment is but then going back to the question that you raised, I think it, I want to go back to, I talked to you about three weeks of Trinity College. Um, and the education is transmogs. In which I attempted to argue that we are not a necessary to catastrophic moment. But that in the United States and the world, we are at the moment a ground field for intervention. Yeah. And that in that moment, the barbarians you know, are taking and are going to take every single aspect of human experience. Every aspect, the current time can be used. And that they have to do that, particularly at this moment, because they are very much aware that the entire system is under threat from what they're not sure of. They can't put their finger on it and say that there is this party, there is that party, there is this what to do. But what you have is a situation where the you have had a Black Lives Matter, you have had a Monty Parish, you have LBGT, you have a whole host of currents that are actually trying to reclaim a different space. Yes. And that is unsettling the kind of narrative common sense. And so that the question of education, what you teach, becomes critical. Question of history, which is why, you know, from 1994, the changing all of it, that right, becomes critical. Because what you're doing is this month, the idea of the United States as this exceptional space. But that all of that it has. Is, and they can't make up their mind between Trump and the Santos and so on and so forth. And then the liberals are absolutely paralyzed because they they know that there is something that is not that they are being attacked from the right flank, exactly. from the barbarian flank. Exactly. But to actually do something 
would mean then rethinking what liberalism is and their liberal imagination was not allowed to do so. What there is is that there's a hope that somehow this thing will kind of work out in what Biden calls a soul of America. God forbid. Right? Yeah. But, but I'm saying so, so to me, it is, it is it's, it's, it's that then, for if you follow what I'm trying to say, for me, it then allows one to think about. You know, again, adoption in a kind of optimism, an optimism of the intellect, but not a style of pessimism, but actually a realism. Uh, uh. Right? A realism that, that then does something that James, I think, thought, say that James thought, thought us, which is to really, from a game of cricket, to basically watch on, on what our captures so wonderfully. Is about motion yeah. and to understand things in motion. And, and, and understanding those things in motion means keeping one's eye on the ball, yeah. right? And keeping one's eye on the ball, in my view, means doing the art, the dance, the music, what the, what the people in their body are doing, what the body is doing. All those kind of things which we are still sometimes paying attention to, but the sort of those kind of accessories and something to illustrate a particular one. Rather than to understand that they actually have a certain purpose and currency as part of human expression, that in, in at moments when the catastrophe looks like the form of the precipice, that's where the thing is. Now, it doesn't mean that, they, that, we, that, that, that we will not end up by Franklin Ababia. That's not what it means. But it means to me that if you pay attention as a critical director, you can then begin to map very carefully what it is that might, what are the possibilities, what are the ideas, what are the new things that people are saying, are trying to do sometimes, not succeeding. And then try to think through, okay, what kind of possibilities are there? Are there possible? Because of the because of with the sport closing of the future is in my view the demise of the species. Mm -hmm. right? and, that, and, that, and that is, I, I, I don't refuse to that, but I hope I, I think I refuse and have a realism because. The, 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 the intellectual traditions that offered from. Now, if we had felt that yeah. there was something, I got it. If, if we could make a way it. out of Norway, I would be sitting up. Wonderful I, way to close this. This wonderful, wonderful way to close. And what a wonderful collective. <laughs> what a wonderful <laughs> collection. Thank you.
create a foundation. Someone mind closing the doors. Well, right. Tilly We began with um, Bruce saying that he couldn't find an index in the index in my last book, item, the item break. And uh, <clears throat> he did a wonderful job of reminding us that there are naive people who believe there are beautiful things somehow that there are beautiful things that have nothing to do with violence. Beautiful things are part of life. How can they not have something to do with them? And we ended with Tony responding to Don by telling us about small things, which matter so much because people can, some people must, some people can, and others will create these things, dance, Awesome. So beginning and end, and it brought to mind for me uh, a very unusual, probably sound like a very unusual uh, fact, which was Theodore Mommsen, the great German historian, winning the Nobel Prize in 1902 for his study of uh, the Roman Empire and his very important examination of the importance of Julius Caesar. Whose significance, I think, in joining these two moments together, beginning and end, according to Momsen, Caesar's significance consists of one thing. It consists of the recognition that if Mediterranean Greco-Roman culture is to survive long enough to take hold in world history, it requires that he, at the head of the legions, exterminate everyone involved. Okay. And so if you remember from your school books, Caesar on the invasion of all, people who were not by any means uh, accidental victims, non-combatants, but rather every was killed. Unless you happen to be lucky enough to live in what is now the city of Abi in the South where Caesar found friends and made his headquarters. The reward for which was building what was called, what's still called the modern, that is Roman city of Al, with its famous Colosseum, where Picasso, another, another perpetrator of violence, did his work in regard to the Arlesian bullfights, which are violent. So those things all somehow came together for me in um, thinking about the beginning of the end of this paper, that is to say, these, these days talks, that is, <clears throat> can there be greatness without violence? Oh, yeah. but only insofar as there can be anything. And on the other hand, there can be untold violence from a point of view of vulnerability aspiring to cultural preservation, seen in world historic terms including a violence that will exterminate people who were doing small things, on the basis of which it would have been for them foolish not to understand the possibility of catastrophe and to have too much confidence in either the politics of their lives or the framework. And so Momsen says we should be grateful to Caesar because as a result of Caesar, we have 
let's quote Holler effect. We have the possibility of civilizing. Again, the reason I thought of that is because that's, he wins the Nobel Prize in 1902. In, 18, in 1890, Alfred Thayer Mahan publishes the great book on uh, naval sea power. And simultaneously, he publishes a series of articles in the Atlantic in which he calls on American intellectuals, writers, and so on to convince the American people that war is not only a necessity, but a good thing. Because the United States is, this is mediated through a reading of Hegel on the ethical state, the United States is obligated to fulfill the Caesarean mission. So this is not American exceptionalism at all. It's the long history, in this case, specific one. Henry Adams comes up again, the relation between US and Rome. What's the relationship with empires? It's the fact of enormous power vis-a-vis -vis the ordinariness of life, which often is allowed to proceed in areas which are either free or not particularly consequential in that they're not yet enough threatening. So maybe the neo-authoritarianism that we see everywhere, including in the US, pushing aside American liberalism to a great extent now, has a lot more to do with the Caesar. Momsen, Mayhem, Malta, uh, we may Anyway, that's just what came to my mind because while I, I don't want people to think I'm a pessimist, <laughs> I'm not. I am also willing to embrace the word realism, if you like. Um, but I am, for a long time, I thought these questions of power, as you know, and, we thought them at first in the smaller frame, the Foucauldian model of power. But increasingly, one comes to understand the, the undeniable threat of mass concentrations of power, the opposition to which I think the basis of everyday life is not promising. And I think if we believe it is, then one of the things we can do sitting, stand, sitting in this building is realize the ease with which Irish monks like ourselves and be brushed aside from essentially relevant, critical, oppositional, annoying positions inside the society. Although in some places, of course, the Irish monks scratch out a little bit. Wow. Anyway, this is uh, This is, uh, this is the, uh, the earliest boundary two initiative, right? Yeah. You recognize it. Yes. You remember the artist? Yes, of course. Yeah. So, yeah. Sanos induced the creation of this as the marker of boundary two. It appears on the leaf of the cover of all of Bill's editions. About two, yes. May I just say this for the formation of the artist? I was going to say it. Okay. I wasn't going to. Go yeah, Fashion got that idea. She yeah. is the artist. Yeah. And he contacted her directly. She was a uh, communist artist, uh, also an uh, exile figure. Um, uh, so it's the first time I think that her work had been shown outside of the And one of the reasons this is significant is because Bill was in Greece during the time of the Bush. To describe the book. And he was aware of the artists and intellectuals who were taken away. And he thought of that, he assumed that history as one of the initiatives behind the creation of the journal. It's not nice. Pardon? It's not nice. Yes. It goes hand in hand with his other claim initiative, which joined by Croach. That the journal arose because there had arisen in American history at that time a series of writers doing original things, challenging all kinds of conventions from everywhere, who, in Bill's allegory, were overthrowing the hegemony of modernism, you know, what Jameson calls suburban something, right? 
and producing the pluralities of postmodernity, which is why at first Bill's notion of postmodern had much more to do with spontaneity, fluidity, plurality, invention than it came to have under the axis of the Heideggerian <laughs> uh, narrative. And it was also very different from what came to be Fred Jameson's postmoderns. So for Bill, it was a kind of liberatory on the sphere of, pub, of, of the public artistic invention, largely represented by new writing uh, that came in part from the crises of the collapse of Spanish narrative of the day, collapse of the efficacy of modernist forms. By that time, Bill, who had written his dissertation on T.S. Eliot, refused to teach T.S. Eliot. So this is bound to the editorial office wants a copy of this for me. It's available for the press. Oh, no. okay. This is B2's 35th year at Pitt. But I have not said there, I'm not including there something I should say. It's also, of course, Pitt, Boundary 2's 32, 35th year as a possession of Duke University Press. Because when the editorial collected, this is the dark, the or the muted stuff under here. Um, thank you. When the editorial collective, um, when the editorial, come on, that's our nice. The editorial uh, collective uh, was formed. It was because Boundary Two was bankrupt. The journal was no longer publishing regularly. Spanos was living on the subscription money. He was using the year subscription fees to cover the printing of one number a year. And so if you look back at the history of the journal, you'll find some years where there's number one, nothing else. Or you'll find some years where there's one, num one physical object called by something or another, numbers one through three, <laughs> all at the same time. So the journal was dying largely because the Sunni system, then the State University of New York system, had decided it had no investment in literary journals or literary arts. Mm -hmm. uh, so at that moment of collapse, Duke University Press was developing a journals division. The previous journals division director became the director of the press. We were one of the first journals to join them. There was a lot of discussion and controversy. Spanos, one of us, Close down the journal rather than sell out to corporate America. I don't know why he thought Duke had any relation to corporate America. He's worried. So it's the 35th year here. And it would have been the last year even if I weren't stepping down here because the dean, the current dean, has withdrawn walls. This year I discovered in the middle of trying to put this together that the boundary to budget line had been zero. So the journal. 35 years here, 35 years at Duke. For a long time now, Rob Dilworth, whose name you mentioned earlier today, has been directing the journal's division of the press. And I'll express my gratitude to Rob sufficiently, but it must be said, and he has been stalled. And when the crisis of funding the journal here became acute, he stepped in every possible way to make sure that nothing failed, that there were cracks. The journal, and from what I understand, the little I understand has been supported to get it forward. So here's the present moment. There's the founders. Spanos. Bob Croach is too often forgotten. Bob Croach, many of you know, was a very important Canadian novelist, primarily winner of the Governor General Prize, the equivalent of the National Book, an important poetic translator. He translated poetry of native. Peoples, particularly in Canada, in Canada, the Great Plains areas, into English. And he wrote some poetry uh, of a national kind. So here, here they are. This is Bill characteristically. This is, in fact, Croach shortly before he was killed in an automobile accident. So in 1988, to keep things going, we had to refound the journal, creating what for a number of years, probably remember this, what was called the Constitutional Collective. 
That's what you gave it. <laughs> right. That is to say, as the collective expanded, it was within the collective essentially a core collective, which were those few of us who were together in actually forming a corporate version of the collective, which then ceded the copyright to Duke University Press uh, on certain terms. Uh, I'm in the dark. Maybe, maybe in books that you can see a little bit more clearly. Um, I don't know if anyone recognizes this person. This is Donald Pease, who I think uh, now holds some job at Dark. Uh, this is Adam Spanos, who I think is now teaching at the University of Chicago. Yeah. Uh, this is some young black guy, uh, better known as Cornell. I'm, I'm going to flip this again. Um, another guy with some kind of Cambridge Association. At that time, he was actually being bored at Princeton, right? Struggling with anything at all, this job. Um, and this, of course, is our lost friend, Joe Richard. This is a hotel room. Sorry. Can we go back with these light and large? Well, just a second. Just the way Victoria just. Oh, okay, can you can it. make it larger? Oh, yeah, that's fair. How oh, much nicer that is. Thank yeah, you. Thank Such you. wonders of technology. So now you've got it. You can see it more clear. Okay. That's great. Right. Can you do the same again? <laughs> This is in a hotel room where we were meeting to form an agreement, create the collective, and to turn it down to Duke. You may think Bill is not here as a matter of protest, but you're wrong. That is not cell phone job. <laughs> There I am doing the perspiration part of it. <laughs> Smiling demonic at the prospects. It's inside. Taking notes. Go I remember when you moved. Pardon me? Oh, you One of my favorite authors is Boyito's Mestephis Mephistophe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here we go again. Once more, we have this darkness guy. And here, we have another member of the founding group. Many of you will not know. And this is Daniel T. O'Hara, who at that time was also being born in Princeton, Jonathan. But well, this is the 80s, uh, right? Neither of us was no, there. that's right. By this time, neither of them were there. That's right. I've got nothing. We escaped the board. So, Dan was, I guess, at that time, a town. And he was for quite a long time a member of the founding collective and resigned as a result of kind of spat within the collective. These things sometimes happen. I am fortunate to say that among the people who created the journal and the collective, among the people who's not here, Dan is alive, as is Cornell. Cornell was recently in Pittsburgh, but not for this weekend. We missed him. Now, this again is Joe. My bring to your attention as one of now absent founding coach. It's the great one. She's a scholar, Joe Scott. And what am I? And here, uh, speaking of terrible shirts, uh, there is the only sign of the presence of Spanos. <laughs> <You know, laughs> by the window. By the window. <laughs> now we know he's there because his son is also. And this is me swirling, bent over in an unmestified, can't say it, uh, position. Now you're wondering who's taking these photos, right? Here we are, Don and Cornell, rooting heavily. <laughs> 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 
Oh, you, well, you passed it, right? Look at that. <laughs> so let me let me flip ahead just a little bit. So this is I, I want to just point to the people, not you. Dan is not physically able to travel, but he's not, hasn't been a member of the collective for a few years. But as a friend, I, you would have wondered who took all those pictures. The other member of the collective, Michael Pace who took the photographs, who lived until a few months ago, just up the street here on Fifth Avenue outside the university, and who is now there too. I'm sorry I do not have a I'm, I'm really, really sorry about this. Well, this is Catherine, it's the first significant non-founding member of the collective. As many of you know, an unbelievable tragic loss happened. Oh, and I think he's here, Joe, because they're at Dartmouth, which has been, in a sense, the, sense of the second poem to Boundary Two because of Don's extraordinary support of the journey. But to those of you who were there for this event, and a few of you were there, uh, Jonathan, um, Nervous, you were yeah, there too, Don, right. so this was actually the event to commemorate Bill Spanos' death at Dartmouth. And these are essentially the last photos of Joe. Papers, you have papers. Yeah. If you look at the papers you have, And here I make my point about archiving. Thank you. you look at those papers. This is an email. Policy changes, new plans for Bermudas. Can you enlarge? Just a little. You can see who was invited to this meeting in Bermuda. The boundaries were collected. And then the following, including the following professors, are Margaret Ferguson, who was on the uh, collective for several years and is now on the editorial board since her retirement. Nancy Fraser, whom I had a running conflict over the Habermas Foucault debates of those days. From Daniel Harrow, Don, William Spanos, deceased, Cornell. The editorial board. Professors Edward Said, Guy Tristevac, Stuart Hall, Frederick Jameson, his survivor. Carl Kroger, our great Japanese colleague. Uh, Masao Yoshi, yeah, yeah. Yoshisama. Great story. The advisory editors, people no longer very much with us. Simon Carroll, okay. Jim Murad, who is alive, but not with us at the moment. Bruce, who is Still here. And I have proven this to Bruce by sending him the letter of invitation from 30 years ago. And Saturday morning. So this was the invitation, consequent upon the information of the journal in relation to you, in which the constitutional court, the founding collective, was going to attempt an expansion both personnel and ideas, and was inviting everyone who was willing already to associate with the journal uh, to meet us in the room. Okay, so what you have here is the summary. Whoops, sorry. What you have here is the summary of the uh, Results of that meeting. Well, so, can I be right there because the Bermuda meeting is 94 and this is dated 95. Uh, that is an additional line, Jonathan, which you know me, I've made a mistake in typing it. The, the dark line in the type says original date 99, it should be 95. 
at 94, 95. That's, thank you for seeing that. You know, me and reading numbers is terrible. Uh, number of these things are, are right. That is, we acted, I think, successfully on a number of these things, not all. So under number three, we no longer wish to accept for publication work, which is nearly professionally accomplished. This is the background to the decision not to accept external submission, which is made explicit. We no longer wish to read. You may remember we were reading over 800 submissions a year and accepting maybe 10. We no longer accept that it's, and I, bring, I brought the substance because this one, one multiple founding, right? The first primary founding, the secondary founding, and now here's another kind of potential for refounding. Uh, we no longer accept that a journal should reproduce, distribute, and circulate knowledge. I think we've come close to honoring that. Not, you've not always success. We've given up what we gave up on nostalgia. We don't want to reestablish the lost past. That's where we lost the Spanos because we changed the subtitle of the journal away from postmodern. We no longer believe that we know what the age requires. This seems to be a theme that's been expressed very often today. Ms. Fox? Would you say? No. It says a few minutes ago. Yeah. Those we thought were the easy thing. The journal must have an agenda. But for this point, I cannot, cannot thank Ronald's insistence on this point from the moment he set foot with the journal. It must drive the production of knowledge and languages. We did that to some extent. We've had influence, if you want to use that word. Work collectively to decide when to complete its projects. I think that's been a success. And when I spoke two days ago about the value of collective and collectivity, it is with this kind of notion I have. Number four has been a success to a degree that I think most other people couldn't imagine. That is to say, people setting aside their own work in order to do work for the journal, even though I sometimes have to send the same email three times. <laughs> right? But it does happen. I mean, the fact that we're here today is proof of that. And then we have the further elaborations, subdivisions over all of these pages. I thought you might want to have this yeah, as, thank you. as a reminder, thank you. Really? as a going forward. So on. And then uh, I thought too, I would uh, thank Bill and Bob. Not here. We're not creating this thing way back 51 years ago. But as we have already said, and Thomas referred to this earlier, to be willing to allow a number of us to attach themselves to it. And it's for so that Bill felt it necessary to separate from us because we had to come too, too far from the Hyperion and too close to corporate America. Most of those things. And then I want to say um, thank you to you all. Everybody has reminded me, the I do, and I don't need reminding at all the importance of collectivity. I don't like that Benjamin bit. I must say that from the struggles of many come achievement of one is against the struggles. I don't like that. Because it's not just their little fragments of this and that. No, there's a Rembrandt, yeah. But there's also a Rubens. <laughs> it's not just uh, interns working. So, I mean, look at the room here. Think of how many individually great scholars here. Right? And each of you has a different set of relations to other important great people using this word purpose. So, uh, my experience in relation to all of them individually and collectively has been that of. The, the commonplace of a uh, figure who's a fraud who's passed himself off as a person who belongs in this company. So I have to thank you for letting me be in that space. 
and uh, wish you the best of luck. I'm going away. I'll be back for a couple of weeks in June. Uh, at the end of June, I step down, and then I also step into a year's sabbatical from the collectors. Well, reason for that is because, as I said to somebody the other day, I was told that I have a very big shadow. Uh, and I had already not said that to myself, but I had already thought it's best that I not be around, just as I not be around up to this point. And I don't, not only think for that reason I don't want to be around, I also don't want to be around because I don't you know, in the, the strong French sense of you know? but, um, So I just, I just can't do it forward right now. Well, you need to keep reserves sabbatical. Yeah. <laughs> that, that is why I thank you for giving me the opportunity to take that on that. Um, Casey and I were coming up against the fact that for the first time now, I need to have your vote to have an appointment to the court because I'm no longer the editor. So of course, what's expected if everyone is going to be appointed to be collected is to ex explain what you've been doing. <laughs> and I said, I'm not gonna do it, right? I think that that would be too far, right? So um, if you vote me to stay on for five years, I will do so, but first year I literally do nothing at all, except answer questions from the office. It from and from Casey of an information. Anyway, thank you all. It's been thank you all. Great. I'm hoping there will be enough food. <laughs> but more importantly, I hope on. Uh, so I'm going to leave now because of the need to hit the caterers, and I'll take those of you who are supposed to come with me. But I'm going to repeat what I said a few minutes yeah. ago. If you don't mind lending a hand in the cleaning up. And then I, I expect to see you seven ish whenever we're up there. But, but you know.